Welcome back, scholars. Uh, today's lesson is about the world after Charlemagne, because unfortunately today Charlemagne is going to be dying on us. But uh, I do have a very special guest interview for us today. Um, I have secured none other than Charlemagne himself. So before we get started with the lesson, let's talk to Charlemagne. Charlemagne, welcome. Well, it appears that Charlemagne has died on us after all. So, oh well, we'll try another interview another time. Before we move on to the world after Charlemagne, it is important that we talk about his reign as a whole. Uh, Charlemagne became co-emperor of the Franks or co-king of the Franks back in 768. So he had been king for a long time. But he started out sharing power with his brother, Carloman. Um, this was a Frankish tradition. In Frankish tradition, you share inheritance with uh, all the sons in a family, all surviving sons. And so Charlemagne and Carloman shared that power. But then, of course, Carloman dies, and he dies early in the early 770s. Uh, so Charlemagne becomes the sole king until 814, a reign of 46 years, which is really astounding during this time period. Um, lifespan of the average person wasn't even 46 years. And here we have somebody not just living for 46, he lived into his 70s, but, for, uh, but reigning, being a king for that long. Now, during his 46 years of uncontested rule, Charlemagne really gets to expand out his empire and uh, spread out a lot. He does this through diplomacy, through threat, through warfare. Um, but by the time of his death, the Franks really do control the vast majority of Western Europe. Um, they control the modern countries of France, Germany, Belgium, Luxembourg, Netherlands, Switzerland, Liechtenstein, Austria, Czech Republic, Northern Italy, Andorra, and you get the point. Huge empire that really does take up the largest part of the European landmass. Um, so he had a lot of land, a lot of land. Now, let's bring back that idea of Frankish inheritance that Frankish custom that a father's wealth is divided among all of his sons evenly. Just as Charlemagne had shared his kingdom with Carloman before he got sole control again, because Carloman died without any sons, Charlemagne's sons expected this empire to be divided amongst them. So this huge unified power is on the brink of division. However, of Charlemagne's three main sons, only one is going to survive longer than Charlemagne. Louis the Pious was the only one of Charlemagne's sons to inherit because he was the only one still alive. His other two sons died prior to Charlemagne's death. So we look at this family tree, we see Charlemagne as the head of the family. He had three sons, Charles, Louis, and Pepin, but only Louis is going to survive. Now, Louis had been serving as a co-ruler since 813, so he'd had a year ruling with his father. Um, and then Charlemagne dies in 814, and Louis is the sole ruler of the Frankish Empire. Now, the reign of Louis. Louis was not Charlemagne, not by any of accounts. Nobody compares Lewis with the quality of leadership that Charlemagne had, but the range of opinions on Lewis is huge. Um, many consider him to be a very weak and cruel ruler. Most agree that he grew into an adequate ruler, but nobody would use any stronger language than adequate. Uh, he was not a great ruler. And in fact, um, of Charlemagne's three sons, he was considered the least fit for rule. Of those three, people did not look forward to Lewis being the guy in charge, and he winds up being the guy in charge. It's actually considered um, very weak, very cruel, and a little side story about his kind of early cruelty uh, relates to his nephew. One of his brother's sons, who does not get an inheritance, um, rises up in rebellion. 
and he wants to control a part of this land. He wants to basically control what would have been his father's if his father had lived. Lewis's reaction to this was not just to uh, put down this rebellion, but to blind his own nephew. And we see that in this image down here. The servants of Lewis, this is King Lewis, ordering the blinding of his own nephew. Now, the idea was only to blind him, but he was blind so fiercely, so violently that he died of it. And Lewis is remembered as somebody who has killed his own family and is not looked on favorably by the Franks at this time. And their unfavorable opinion, particularly amongst his family members, extends throughout Lewis's life. Uh, Lewis is going to fight three major civil wars during his time as king. He's got a long reign, 27 years, again, freakishly long by the standards of the time, very long time to be king, um, but he's gonna fight three civil wars and these are against family. In fact, the last two are against his own sons who have rose up in rebellion against their father because they don't like some of the decisions that he's making about their inheritance. So his own sons are rebelling against him and fighting wars. This is not a close, loving family. Now, Louis dies in 840. And as soon as he dies, three of his sons, later four, the fourth will join in as well, um, begin to fight for control and begin to fight over this kingdom. And they fight for three years before they come to an agreement in 843, the Treaty of of Verdun. This is gonna permanently break apart Charlemagne's empire. All that work that Charles the Hammer, Pepin, and Charlemagne had done, that Louis had somehow held together, gets shattered by the Treaty of Verdun. There is no more Frankish kingdom. There are three Frankish kingdoms. We have the West Frankish kingdom. Oops, let me uh, go back for a moment. We have the West Frankish Kingdom. We have the East Frankish Kingdom. And what was called for a time the Middle Frankish Kingdom, but became the Kingdom of Lothar. Lothar being one of Louis's sons. This is going to break up that empire into three kingdoms. Now, these are powerful kingdoms. They're not weak. I mean, they're sizable in population, wealth, resources, but they're not the Frankish Empire, and they're not going to have that kind of sway. Now, the longer term impact of Verdun is that it really pretty much creates modern France and a more modern idea of Germany. Uh, Italy too, kind of, um, but that idea of Italy goes away and comes back later. Um, but both France and Germany can really trace their roots back to Charlemagne. Uh, France is going to maintain something of a uh, cohesion as a nation going forward. Germany is going to lose some of it. They continue to break up a little bit and then they come back together and um, they kind of coalesce around this idea of the Holy Roman Empire later, that there's a lot of different kingdoms ruled by one emperor. Um, but one thing that everybody kind of learns as a result of this, not just the Franks, but Europe as a whole, is that if you want continuity, if you want strength, if you want power, then you cannot divide up your inheritance this way. It just doesn't work. It leads to warfare, division, setbacks. So the Franks and others within a couple of generations start to get rid of this idea of sharing inheritance equally. And they instead shift to primogenitor. That is the firstborn son gets everything. And then if he chooses to give little pieces to his brothers and nephews and nieces and children, that is his decision. But the firstborn son inherits. And this is where we see this idea content, uh, continuing through Roman history, not Roman history, apologies, European history, where the king's son inherits. It had not been the case with the Franks and a few others. It will be going forward because everybody saw the mess that was created here. Um, the title of emperor itself, there's some 
debate and some disagreement about exactly how that should be handled. It does eventually move on to uh, the East Frankish Empire, which becomes the Holy Roman Empire. This is what's located in modern Germany. Um, and the Holy Roman Emperor maintains this imperial title handed down by the Pope. And the Franks in uh, West Francia, the ones that become French, they just become kings. So that is a little bit of what comes after Verdun. But uh, as you can see, Charlemagne was important. He was the glue that held this all together. Once he was gone, the Frankish Empire kind of dissolved. And that is the end of our discussion on Charlemagne. So I hope you enjoyed this series on Charlemagne. Uh, we've got the Crusades coming up soon, and I hope you will enjoy that. So long.